From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deck, and most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. At the top of the show, there's a very important disclaimer that we need to put here at the very, very front. Uh, This is a ghoulish, grisly episode, and this is an episode that sadly is going to have a... is going to be something that many of our U.S.-based conspiracy realists have personally encountered, perhaps without knowing that they have encountered this. So it's important, but be warned, uh, if visceral descriptions are not your thing, this might not be the one for you. As in, as in descriptions of viscera, right? Not, not just like very detailed uh, descriptions. Oh, well, both, both. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've talked... We've talked about organ donation in the past. And, you know, when done with consent, informed consent, when done with high standards of safety, donating your organs is one of the most noble acts you as an individual can do for literally anyone. You're sacrificing part of yourself to give someone else, often a stranger, a new lease on life or to allow them to live some kind of life at all. Uh, People can also upon their death, donate their bodies to science. And the hope here would be that this posthumous sacrifice, because it's still a sacrifice, will further research in any number of fields, ultimately, in theory, making the world overall a better place. Unfortunately, as we found to our great sorrow, this does not always work out the way we would collectively hope. Here are the facts. I mean, we have to talk about donating your body to science. Have you, have you guys ever thought about this, or do you have any family member who ever considered this? Uh, yeah, we mentioned it not long ago when we covered the the heads that were stolen from that truck back in the day. And I have no personal connection to body donation, at least in the way we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, it was interesting to kind of go through the distinction, right, of being an organ donor versus donating your body to science. And we'll get into some of the minutia of those differences. But we that was kind of my first uh, exposure to the fact that those two things are not the same. Yeah, they're very much not the same. And this is actually, you know, as a guy who tried to donate one of his eyes while alive <laughs> and ran into complications, <laughs> uh, donating your body to science it's a noble thing, but unfortunately, even on my end, it's something that I would be very cautious about. Here's why. Here's First, let's tell you how the process is supposed to work. Generally, it goes like this. You make the decision while you are still alive. For some people, this is simply a matter of their personal philosophy or beliefs. For some people, it's um, maybe they have a terminal condition and they think, science may be able to help other people with my condition if I donate my body to the cause. So you figure out where you want your body to go. There are a lot of places. There's not one single, like, donate your body here outfit. Uh, Most of them are going to be university-associated medical schools. Some are private industries or organizations, rather. And then some are government agencies. And uh, it's kind of an audition process, which might surprise a lot of us. You have to fill out a donor consent form well ahead of time. And it's very, very, it's so very important to be on the same page with your loved ones. You have to make sure that they know about your decision. It needs to be written into your will. You should have a will. And uh, it's also possible for your family to just decide to donate your body when you die, whether or not you've talked about it for a number of reasons, some of which are quite tragic. So if you don't want that, make sure to stay on good terms with them. Like, you know, leave on a good note if you can. (laughs) Well, like they would like donate your body to science out of spite. (laughs) No, as we learned from a Reuters investigation, it's often because people don't have enough money, even to afford a basic cremation. And we're going to get into it, but there are one of the most likely reasons that a body would be donated is because there's not money available for a funeral service and or, you know, burial or cremation. 
In the U.S., for sure. Yeah, you'll. So let's say you've decided this. Your family's on the same page, and uh, they want to help you. In theory, be part of the greater good. So there'll be an organization, um, or hopefully a nonprofit, uh, that will screen potential donors while they're still alive. This is a thorough medical exam, and it includes, you know, a little bit of your past medical history. Questions about illnesses, surgeries you may have had, any IV drug use, communicable diseases. Let's say you set that up and you pass that test and they say, okay, you will qualify for this. You go on, you live your life to the fullest possible extent until you expire. But when you die, there's a second test that chosen institution is going to now for the second time determine if they'll accept your body. That's right. Not everyone gets accepted because these institutions, when they agree in that screening while you're alive, they're still not legally required to take the cadaver if it doesn't meet those standards. And those standards aren't things like um, age or ethnicity or genetic information. They're mainly things that could could be a health risk to people who will be working with that human tissue later, you know, um, like you're probably not going to get accepted for a science tissue donation if you have HIV, some kinds of hepatitis, syphilis, kidney failures, bad, viral infections that result in isolation, that kind of stuff. And and um, if you were very, very overweight or in some cases very, very underweight, then you may also not fit the bill. Um, and that's where we run into one of the first problems. Because let's say we've all agreed, right, um, we're the average American family, which means that a funeral expense is going to be a terribly hard bill to pay at one of the most vulnerable times of our lives. But what if the body of our loved one gets declined? We have to make sure we have back pocket arrangements. Otherwise, we're going to find ourselves stranded with a dead body on our hands and no real plan for what to do with it next. So that's that's the first pitfall, but let's let's stay positive for a second. Let's say your body is accepted. Okay, so if your body is accepted by the institution of your choice, uh, that group then covers the costs because this is a value to them, clearly. And that includes transportation, uh, filing of the death certificate, the cremation after use, um, and the return of the cremains. Um, some groups, in fact, go a step further and require that you arrange delivery uh, of the body to them, especially if it's in another state. Uh, and there is, in fact, an entire industry built around the transportation of bodies. So what next? Um, once your body is in uh, the particular institution's facilities, they use your remains to further whatever research or mission they're focused on. And that's going to be a big driving factor for the most part, uh, in the individual's choice to donate their body to said institution. Like you said, Ben, maybe they have a particular condition they think um, using their body for research could help. Maybe it's someone who is an alumni of said institution or it's somebody who, you know, was a professor there or they just believe in the cause of that particular institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but this is this gives you a little bit of a. Um visibility on what will happen to the body. But here's another sticky wicket. Most places will not let you donate your body for a specific purpose. As a matter of fact, the vast majority will not allow you to do so. You can go maybe to um, to a medical outfit that is doing Alzheimer's research, for example, and you can say, I'll donate this body to this organization because my loved one had Alzheimer's. And then you, you have a pretty good guess that they're going to use this body in Alzheimer's research. But these places will never guarantee that. They want to be able to use that body as needed. And that body needs to come with all of its organs, meaning these two activities are mutually exclusive. You cannot donate your body to science and participate in an organ donor program. Other groups, like Science Care, which we'll talk about a bit further in today's episode, do allow both organ donation and whole body donation. Important note, the companies do not pay the families involved. Hear that closely. They do not pay the families involved because that would be illegal, not to mention, in my opinion, a bit ghoulish and probably cause a lot of problems, especially in places with uh, skyrocketing inequality. 
Absolutely. And it, it seems to go hand in hand with the idea of you may donate your body to an institution where their primary focus of research is something that you personally believe in, but it would be logistically a nightmare to say, okay, we guarantee this donation will be used for this because it just doesn't really make sense uh, if they need it for something else. And then all of a sudden you have angry family members on your hands that just, yeah. And just to be clear, we're talking about these are institutions that do this, that are accredited, that are uh, like the good. We were talking about the good guys, the positive way for this to happen. Yeah, the John Hopkins, you know, mm-hmm. like the Yale School of Medicine, stuff like that. Uh, or maybe even some pharmaceutical companies who are working on R&D or funding research. And at times there's a lot of overlap. Uh, at this point, you're wondering, OK, guys, I get it. How often does this actually happen? Well, well, here's the problem. Uh, and I, I want to shout out some great work at Reuters, some great work at some other, other things that I, I was researching this. We have put a lot of time into looking into this. And I don't know about you, Matt. I don't know about you, Noel. But I was unable to find a real accurate statistic on how frequently this occurs in the even even when I qualified it, I was able to find one thanks to Reuters, uh, which we'll get to in a second. But humanity is collectively not sure how often this happens every year, much less how often it's happened in total. No really accurate statistics exist because there is no central regulatory body tracking these what are called anatomical gifts. That's another euphemism you run into. Uh, You'll find some experts estimating that medical schools collectively get about 10,000 to 15,000 bodies donated uh, per year. Uh, But that doesn't count all the additional bodies going to private entities, to corporations, and again, to government agencies. Uh, There was was a number back in 2009 from uh, uh, an article written by a professor at Harvard Business School who said the number of bodies donated in the U.S. to all groups totaled about 20,000. That sounds like a lot. It's still not enough. Multiple institutions continually report an ongoing need for more corpses. And this has led to serious problems. As we speak today, they're ongoing and they're crucial concerns. When it comes to this grisly, yet perhaps paradoxically important practice, we found that there is definitely some stuff they don't want you to know. What are we talking about? I'll tell you after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. Let's talk about body brokers. How does how does this grieving family actually get past this tragedy? What makes them sometimes donate to science? And uh, after they do that donation, however they see it happening, how does it get to those institutions? Several times on this show and a couple other ones, we've talked about resurrection men back in the day who would acquire bodies because there was a bit of an issue there where it was legal to experiment on a dead body, but it was illegal to, you know, go to a graveyard and dig up a dead body or to acquire a dead body from the morgue or a recently deceased human being. Um, We're entering a weird gray area here where we have been for many, many years where there's, there's really a, a price loophole, honestly, that has created an entire new market for dead bodies and people are resurrecting resurrection men. Just so. Yeah. Because the resurrection men idea came about due to a odd legal loophole. Uh, Several centuries ago, it was absolutely legal to experiment on dead bodies, medical researchers, doctors, and so on, surgeons, anatomist, but it was generally illegal to procure them. Kind of like some of those drug laws that say possession of marijuana is okay, but buying it is a big no-no. So this gray market slash illegal market of resurrection men arose and they were body snatchers. You can argue just like we did, Matt, that resurrection men have been resurrected. Body brokers, who don't like the name body brokers, by the way, uh, they'll, they'll prefer the term non-transplant tissue banks. They buy and sell human body parts or entire corpses. And wait, you might be saying, buy, sell? How can they get away with that? Didn't you just say this was illegal? 
Well, here's the thing. In the U.S. and several other countries, the organ transplant trade is heavily regulated, in theory. Shout out to our other episode on the red market. But you may be surprised to learn, Uncle Sam does not, has never, regulated the use of human body parts in research, training, and so on. So it's kind of like, if you think of a human body like a car, it's kind of like you you do have to have some paperwork and accountability when you're selling certain pieces of the car. But if you just sell the whole car or you just sell these pieces that don't qualify, you know, as organs, then do what you want. You literally have to have no qualification. I guess I imagine they figure they've already ticked the box for that regulation by overseeing the procurement stage. And then as long as they go through the right channels to get them to the research institutions, then go with God at that point. I'm sure you guys found it as well. There is only one state I know of that keeps detailed records on the industry, and that is the state of New York. Uh, They looked at numbers that went from 2011, 2014, uh, and found that companies doing business in New York, not necessarily based there, but doing business there, shipped at least 100,000 body parts across the entire country over the course of three years. And that's a weird number, especially when you reference it to the idea that um, only the Harvard, our Harvard professor pal says only 20,000 were shipped across the U.S. all in all. Right. So it seems like there's a lot of disturbing variance in the estimates. But think about it right now, as macabre as it sounds, whatever you do, whatever your qualifications are, if you happen to have a box of heads or a hand of glory and you didn't get it through the commission of a crime, you can sell it. You can like go online just start a Squarespace or something. I don't think they want that association. Uh, but you could just start a website and sell this stuff, and it's absolutely legal. Surely there's some way to uh, to document chain of custody. I mean, they can take your word for it that you didn't get this hand from the commission of a crime? This is a good question, Noel. So the issue on the table then is that it, the onus of responsibility often falls upon the medical institutions accepting the accepting the remains. So they have their own internal standards, which can vary from one place to the next, su- such that they can say, look, this doesn't seem right to us. Well, we can't, we can't accept this in good faith. It reminds me of the argument you often hear about like campaign donations where it's like, well, you don't care where it came from. That's not our job, but but like it is their job uh, in some respect. And it definitely is the job of the medical institutions, but it could also be an argument they make where, oh, everything seemed on the up and up. Just turns out it was actually uh, from something completely uh, illegitimate. Yeah, it's it's passing the buck of accountability. Right. There's a lot of not my jobism in some of these things, especially when you get to the um, non transplant tissue banks or body brokers. The Reuters thing that Matt and I are referring to is an excellent deep dive series, uh, multi part. And we're going to pull uh, from that several times today. One of the first things I like to pull from there is a quote from Angela MacArthur. So this series, this quote was from 2017, but the series uh, goes back a few years. Uh, Angela MacArthur at the time was the director of the body donation program at University of Minnesota Medical School. She was also once upon a time, the chairperson of the state's anatomical donation commission. So in other words, a world-class expert. And what she had to say was not pretty, and it is not nuanced. It is a clear statement of a problem. She says, quote, the current state of affairs is a free-for-all. We're seeing similar problems to what we saw with grave robbers centuries ago. Uh, And then she continued, I don't know if I can state this strongly enough. What they, meaning body brokers, are doing is profiting from the sale of humans. Wow. Strong. It's a lot of money to be made. And, you know, there's... There's some frankly offensive stuff, too, about this when you look at the price per body, you know, because that's what they're doing. They're putting a price on on human remains. And Ben, you've mentioned like the bodies exhibit 
oftentimes uh, as uh, the provenance of those cadavers being sketchy at best. Yeah, and that's um, the bodies exhibit. Unfortunately, those uh, corpses were often likely taken from prisoners who did not have informed consent, and their family didn't either. Uh, but yet, yeah, Matt, if you want to go into the price of a body on a body broker market, let's let's get into it. Yeah, let's let's quickly do that. According to the 2017 investigation by Reuters titled The Body Trade, you can find it Reuters.com. They found that a body broker or a human tissue <laughs> trader uh, could sell a single human body for somewhere between three thousand to five thousand dollars. So that's like a. Uh, a whole human body. Yeah. You could also cut that body up and mm-hmm. get part price per part, which is where it gets right. really Do you get crazy. more in totality if you're selling individual parts than you would as a whole body? You yes. can. It's chop shop rules. I would uh, think you would, yeah. I nice. found, because um, I, I was digging in, because it was hard to find the numbers here, so I, I, I also looked at the Reuters stuff, and then I went to um, a source in FDA from 2021 and their estimate was a little bit higher and I think I know why. So they said in general, you're looking at around $5,000 for a whole body. They said prices sometimes top $10,000 because body parts like may fit certain specifications. Like we want to look at this medical condition and to make it even more ghoulish, that's if you sell those parts. Body brokers don't always sell the parts. Sometimes they rent it. Sometimes they lease it and they yeah. get it back. Yeah. How is that even possible? Well, in that Reuters article, there's an example in 2013 of a shipment to a, quote, Florida orthopedic training seminar. An orthopedic training seminar that included 27 shoulders. Now, I can imagine... If that training seminar needs just the specific shoulder for, you know, however many hours that's going to be, theoretically, as grisly as it is, you could then ice, put that shoulder back on ice or those 27 shoulders and then ship it back to the company. I imagine it's to demonstrate a medical device of some kind. That could happen too, or to train um, to train EMTs, for instance, oh, or resuscitation. Uh, surgeons also, surgeons. I I think I put this somewhere else in here, but surgeons also have um, routinely said that three D modeling or mannequins or simulations is not like the real thing, and that to do their jobs well, they need to practice on actual bodies in a way that does not risk injuring people while they're, you know, earning their surgeon stripes. This is um this is weird because there is clearly a need, but oh, and I also need to point out that source I mentioned earlier is NFDA is the National Funeral Directors Association. And they're they're making a lot of moves actually in favor of reining in the body broker trade. So kudos to them. But so the issue here is that there is a ton of money to be made. We talked about it, right? Especially considering that sometimes body brokers or these banks can function as libraries, lending out components of what was once a human being. They can make a lot of money, but they're making it without the informed consent of a deceased person's family, often in very misleading ways. And of course, the deceased person's family is not receiving any compensation for this, that would be illegal. But this somehow is. And one thing that's important to recognize about the way this industry works is it revolves around the ability to access a large supply of bodies that are essentially free, that have nowhere nowhere to go, nowhere to rest. And what, what happens is uh, these are... You know, you've heard the term healthcare, folks. Think of the term death care. That that is an umbrella term encompassing every aspect of what happens when you have to uh, try to try to figure out how to move on with your life, try to figure out how to help uh, someone you love that has passed be put to rest in the manner of their choosing and respectfully. But and and we'll see this through some specific examples. Um, this hits. This hits low-income families really hard. You're desperate. Maybe you've had, um, 
maybe you've had a relative or a parent or a child or a sibling who has struggled with chronic medical condition of one sort or another all their life. You've paid for multiple surgeries, right? You've paid for multiple treatments. And this is the U.S., so it is where the like the one of the top causes of bankruptcy is a medical disaster, right? So you have drained whatever resources you could access, and unfortunately, your loved one has passed away. You cannot afford the often uh, unexpectedly high cost of a funeral or of a of a cremation, and then someone comes along and they say, "You know." You can donate your loved one's body to science. We'll take care of the expenses and we will connect them with someone who will help make the world a better place for the generations to come after. And then when they're done, when this operation is done, we will cremate the remains for you. We will give them to you free of charge. And isn't that something your loved one would have wanted to do to help other people? Are you saying there are like reps for these organizations that seek these situations out? Oh, yes. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. And often it will be in the form of just a little slip of paper or a brochure that ends up at an actual funeral home. Not always, but sometimes at a funeral home as uh, an option C, right? Uh, Burial, cremation, or C. Right. And this, this all means that often due to the way health and death are priced in the United States. Strange to say it that way, but it's not hyperbolic. This means that often families feel they have no choice other than accepting the help of a body broker. And that's where it leads us to controversy, corruption, conspiracy, crime, obviously inequality, huge part of this. No argument against it. But before we continue, I do think it's important to note that not all of these body brokers, these non-transplant tissue banks, are inherently sinister. This is a thing that needs to happen. Donated bodies are an essential role in training, education, research. This is why a lot of people aren't dead today, to be honest with you. Well, I feel like we led with that for sure. I mean, the idea of this profession or this the need for these go-betweens is not inherently malevolent. Somebody has to act as the, you know, liaison between the families of the departed and where those bodies end up. And usually they're just satisfying the wishes of that person. Yeah. Uh, well, and, th- and think about the good Ben's talking about. We, we mentioned it at the top a little bit. The cadavers, body parts, they're used by medical students all, all, all the time. Medical students, they need human bodies and sometimes just body parts to actually study the techniques that they're learning in medical school so that they can apply them later. Uh, there's, I mean, there's so many different uses for for a cadaver in the medical field that if you did not have them, we would be out of luck as humans. Mm-hmm. Like we mentioned surgeons, uh, we mentioned paramedics. We should also talk about uh, how people come up with the idea of new surgical instruments. You, you certainly wouldn't want to be having open heart surgery and then be the person who died on the table that helped the surgeon figure out, oh, there's a better widget for this. You would like for that widget to already be there when it's time for you to go under the knife. So this does make sense. It it teaches us about implants, techniques that could be evolved, new medicines and treatment for disease, like serious stuff. So the need's there. And we know this practice does produce measurable, significant, very positive results for living people. The problem is there is so much stuff about this trade that we do not know, including people who are experts in studying it. Like Ray Madoff is a Boston College Law School professor who studies the way that the legal system treats the remains of dead people. Yeah, and I mean, and if this guy is is open in the way that we're about to, to point out about what he doesn't know, I mean, I think that says a lot. He says, quote, we know very little about who is acquiring these bodies and what they are doing with them. Uh, And then back to the Reuters piece that we've been talking about, um, a journalist by the name of Brian Groh, he actually tried a little experiment where they contacted a broker in Tennessee, and after just a few emails, they were able to buy a cervical spine and two human heads. 
Yep, yep, yep. And one of those surgical instruments that, or, or let's say a class of surgical instruments that was developed through the use of bodies and, and testing on bodies was something like the saws that are used in surgeries, surgical saws, various types of bone saws and things like that, specifically saws that were designed to cut a human body open and cut it up perhaps into parts or amputate uh, a limb or something like that. As part of that Reuters investigation, they found that those same, uh, those same tools that were developed for working on bodies are often too expensive for the companies that are being started by body brokers, the body broker, smaller companies. So they found that they had actually been using chainsaws to mm-hmm. cut up human bodies after they were donated to their and, companies. And at least one grizzly at all. Grizzly case, yeah. And that guy was also renting body parts out. Uh, yes. Uh, I also want to add, so w- another little piece of further digging I did is uh, you always want to try to go to the source of either side of an argument. So if you want to see people who are championing these Tissue banks, you want to visit the American Association of Tissue Banks. And they have, they have, um, they break down the needs that we're describing, but they, I would argue, kind of gloss over some of the problems. Let's, let's go back to this. The idea that just a, you're, you may be just a few emails away from finding someone who says, yes, I can get you a spine. I can get you a head. How many heads do you want? You know what I mean? And then you start (laughs) talking price breaks or whatever. But Grow, being a journalist, was horrified and I think heartbroken to learn the origin of one of these bodies. Uh, The the outfit that sold it to Restore Life USA uh, didn't know that they were selling this to a reporter. He found out the spine came from a young man named Cody Saunders who had uh, the struggle that I described earlier. He died on his 24th birthday after a long battle with uh, congenital conditions like a hole in his heart, longstanding kidney issues. This poor guy had gone through 66 surgeries, more than 1,700 rounds of dialysis. And again, the U.S. is a lot of things but it is not good at healthcare, right? Like poverty is a big cause of death, especially if you look at preventative medicine in this country. Anyway, even if you're a relatively well-off family, this kind of medical expense can put you in a really tough spot. And the Saunders family didn't have the money for burial cremation when Cody passed away of a heart attack. Uh, So they thought the best course for them to help people. And they thought, you know, this is what our son would want too, was to donate his body to this outfit, Restore Life USA, which is a for-profit organization. The month after he died, Restore Life sold Cody Spine to Reuters for $300 plus shipping. That's all it took. And I, I always assumed, I guess, that that it would be much more expensive. Later, Uh, These same reporters would go on to buy those two heads from the same place and they consulted experts and they said, okay, look, here's what we got. You know what I mean? Here's what they went to people who would be in charge of ethically sourcing human body parts for medical institution and 201, everyone that they asked, each individual said, this paperwork is crazy sloppy. There's not a good chain of custody. Everything's wrong with this. I don't know if I, in my position at this school or at this university or at this uh, institution, I don't know if I could ethically accept this. And that is only one example of what we found is a, is a very widespread process. Uh, I suggest we pause for a moment for a word from our sponsors and then dive deeper into the dilemmas because there are even more, unfortunately. This is... We're going to try to do some lighthearted episodes later, folks. And we have returned. Again, as we said, there are mission critical problems with the system as it stands today. Even a lot of tissue banks will say the same thing. 
They may be, for the record, talking about their competitors, but everybody knows there's a problem. These families are not paid, but these for-profit bank brokers are definitely making a ghoulish amount of cash. One of the sources I referenced earlier, the American Association of Tissue Banks, a trade organization representing these folks, uh, says the following when they say, how does NADO, that's the acronym they prefer, a non-transplant anatomical donation organization, how do they collect funding? Their quote is, in order to sustain a mission of helping donors and their loved ones fulfill their wishes to aid researchers, educators, and clinicians in advancing science and medicine, most often at no cost to the donor or his or her loved ones, NADOs must fund their operations by charging a fee for service to those who are requesting and being provided non-transplant gifts. So they're basically saying what we said. They're just trying to make it sound a bit more diplomatic, right? Am I reading that correctly? I think, yeah, we got to get a donation. That's right. I, I kind of wonder what their balance sheets look like, because obviously they're providing value to some of these lower income families in exchange for their loved ones by you know offering the cremation and the funeral process and all of that stuff to pay for. Like, is that considered the cost of doing business? Is that like recouped? Like, I just I'd be really fascinated to see what their ledgers look like. That's if they're actually using a, you know, a standard crematorium, right? An actual thing that's meant to cremate human bodies, because that's not always the case. Because uh, those are expensive as hell. And there are other What's ways to burn bodies. Like with a blowtorch? What are we talking about here? Uh, back to that Reuters article, they mention a couple of instances where bodies were being cremated, if you call that cremated, within medical waste incinerators, mm-hmm. which is just, it's a different, it's a different system. And well, I don't, it's, it's, I it's like, couldn't tell you the difference, but. But it does probably mean that the, the cremains are not pure, right? You're getting some stuff, your loved ones in part, but probably some other mix-ins in there. You're, you're often only getting, yeah, this is what I want to say. You're often, you're often getting adulterated remains. You could compare it to a mass grave at times, uh, which I was on the fence about mentioning on air, but it's true. Uh, you're also getting only a portion of the person's body being cremated and the rest being shipped off. This is this is a ghoulish way to make money for a lot of um, bad faith actors. They also take a lot of agency away from the family of a donor. You know, it is not infrequent for body brokers to obtain a corpse through fraudulent means, misleading the, the loved ones and the survivors. Uh, there's another story that I saw in multiple places. Uh, Doris Stouffer, uh, when she passed away, Her family, in particular uh, her son, donated her body to science because Doris, they thought, would be able to help with further research into Alzheimer's. And there's a lot of exciting, promising research going into Alzheimer's right now. So this makes sense. And it's been going on for years. So her son, Jim Stouffer, contacts an outfit called Biological Resource Center. What do we always say about organizations with cartoonishly vague, innocuous names. Just watch out. Just watch out for them. Uh, yep. Yeah, this was a company locally based in Arizona. This story takes place in Sunrise, Arizona. Uh, and they broker the donation of human bodies for research. When he contacted them, they were on the ground in an hour dispatching a driver to collect the body. So he signs a form. Keep in mind, he's in the depths of grief. His mother has passed away, uh, and he authorizes medical research on her body. And then, importantly, he checks a specific box on this form. It's a boilerplate form that prohibits military, traffic safety, and other, quote, non-medical experiments. Ten days later, he and his family receive her cremated remains. And then later, they learn what actually happened. Yeah, so workers at uh, BRC... Um, detached one of Dora Stouffer's hands for cremation, as you mentioned, only getting partial uh, remains back. Um, After sending those ashes back to her son, the company sold and shipped the rest of her body to a taxpayer-funded research project for the U.S. Army. So that box that uh, Jim Stouffer ticked clearly 
either they didn't care or it was not legally binding. It was just kind of like, you know, to, for optics. Uh, her brain was never used for Alzheimer's research. Instead, Stover's body became part of an army experiment to measure damage caused by roadside bombs. <sighs> Mm -hmm. She was one of at least 20 other cadavers that were used in this uh, same way. I don't know that we're, uh, we we necessarily know the source of the other bodies. Was this all through the same organization? Unknown, not necessarily. It's possible, but it also wouldn't be uncommon for there to be multiple contractors or sourcers here. Uh, Sourcers, I mean, not sorcerers. Uh, Just really quickly, guys, I didn't realize that, human remains would be used for what was it quote traffic safety mm-hmm. uh like testing yeah, traffic safety. crash test dummies yep i've got a car stuff episode on that uh corpses were used for a while to test uh you know all those old car commercials where you see the car hitting the wall they used to until they built crash test dummies they used to just use corpses also i uh, want to take out a moment to shout out project sunshine we did an episode on that if you would like to learn more about the unethical ways in which your government uses human bodies uh, and not just it's not restricted to the U.S. Uh, and it's not something that happens as a historical footnote. But, yeah, they're used that the with children, to too. Yes, that was usually using the body parts of children to test radiation. Do we know around what year the testing was done there on Doris? It sounds like it was, you know, research for maybe around the Afghanistan or Iraq wars um just i'm imagining roadside bombs they were very interested in that at the time let's see so it was 20 i want to say 2015 oh or wow. so, no i, I want to say maybe a little before 2015 so it may have been 2014 uh the good news is okay. that um Stouffer, the Stouffer family did later see justice because there was a lawsuit against Biologic Resource Center and its or Biologic Resource Center and its owner, one Stephen Gore. Talk about nominative determinism. Uh, Gore pled yes, guilty yeah. to uh, running an illegal operation because of the fraud he was committing, uh, and he got he pled guilty in 2015, but he was sentenced to uh, probation. Although I think it's hard to argue this is a victimless crime. I think it would be hard to swallow an argument, but I could imagine the argument being made. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, too true. I mean, and and it is very difficult to articulate how horrific this can be for survivors of these situations. Brokers, as we established, can turn a profit of thousands of dollars for each body donated because their margin is so low, right? And because we know a little bit about their profit margin, I'm not saying the arguments about being servants of a greater good are wrong. I'm not even saying they're insincere, but it's a little tougher to believe them. You know what I mean? I think you, you were right to be skeptical. And eventually, the good news is more and more people began to listen to the experts who were saying this is basically the Wild West in a terrible way. Something has to be done. So politicians uh, began to further understand the extent of this problem, and they started to take legal action. In the U.S., we're proud to report just last year, uh, Congress has brought more transparency and accountability to this grisly industry, or they're trying to, through the introduction of something called the Consensual Donation and Research Integrity Act, which you can read in full, available online. It's not a law yet, but it very much should be. And it seems to be gathering a lot of support, which is positive. Yes. I mean, think about where we were, guys. There were, there were private companies popping up all over the country here in the U.S. that were new body brokers with just a name. You start a business. There was no regulation, really. And... You, you, what you needed were a couple of freezers, maybe, you know, a, a, an array of freezers, let's say, depending on how many bodies you wanted to handle at a time, and at least one cargo van or uh, shipping <laughs> vehicle of some sort. And that's literally all you need. The actual product that you're going to be brokering and selling gets donated to you, right? It's free. Then you get to make straight profit off that thing. Uh, the... And then shipping cost is literally your only other issue. It's crazy 
how much money could be made for very little investment up front. And it, thank goodness there's some kind of regulation happening. Well, sure. on the way. Hopefully it yeah. does end up being happening. <laughs> actual regulation. But but fortunately for uh, what, what I would typify as the, the larger majority of good guys in this scenario, uh, hopefully – for decent people, uh, you'll take a little bit of um, a little bit of reassurance knowing that even the most uh, Machiavellian politician has to understand that voting against the bill like this is political suicide. You know what I mean? Like, how big is the grave mm-hmm. robbing lobby? Is the kind of question <laughs> they'll have back, uh, you know, in, in the back rooms of the campaign office. Well, I think one thing we haven't really talked too much about is just the fact that for not only is there grief involved and people, you know, maybe of lower means uh, being taken advantage of when they're at their, you know, maybe lowest point, but also just the idea of religion and what the way a body is handled means for individuals' religions and how the reality of what's actually happening once people find out or if they ever find out, it could absolutely negate these deepest, most, you know, sacredly held beliefs and and could cause some serious trauma and concern with individuals that are worried now maybe their loved ones aren't transitioning into the afterlife properly because of the way their corpse was handled. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I I had wanted to I had looked into that as well and a little bit of it was cutting for time, but one one of the most amazing things is the way that religions interact with the modern day. And there's a pretty there's a pretty impressive argument that a lot of religions have made about what they see as being a good person. Because you might be surprised to find that some religions that have very specific requirements for how a body is treated after after death or after physical death, I should say, uh, they allow for organ donation. They allow for the contribution of a greater good. And and the leaders of these schools of spiritual thought have spent a, a great deal of time thinking about this. And I commend that decision, you know, to sure. to say like, hey, what is what is more noble than than saying I know I know my heart's been through a lot but I would love if it was beating for you you know I think that's that's pretty impressive I think you have a, another career ahead of you as a, a greeting card writer, Ben. Oh, thank you. You know, I almost did get a job one time writing for Hallmark, but they wanted you to move uh, to like Hallmark headquarters. Yeah, I know, I know, right? Uh, but that was before everybody worked from home. At this point, maybe it's important for us to say that the future of the body broker industry I don't know. It's tough to predict where it's going to go because, again, there's a genuine need. People who are listening to the show today, some of our fellow conspiracy realists are alive because of the research and the discoveries that came from this these practices. Uh, and honestly, unless something big changes in the United States specifically, families often are going to need some kind of financial assistance to bury or cremate their loved ones with or inter them with the respect that you know they deserve that every human being deserves so how do we how do we ensure those wishes are upheld how can we help both the living and the dead have full knowledge of what they're agreeing to i don't know these aren't rhetorical questions i just i don't know the i don't know if anyone knows the answer somehow make funerals less expensive Good God. I mean, but it all comes down to a free market economy. Like if you're able to set up a business that does a service uh, that you are paid for, then you have a right to charge what you want for it. You know, uh, it's, it's hard. It's a hard thing to police, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Unless you make it part of a government entity and just regulate the hell out of it. I'll give you a quote from a dude named Steve Palmer who, according to the Reuters investigation, is an Arizona mortician who serves on that thing you're talking about, Ben, the National Funeral Directors Association. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, he serves on their policy board. His quote is, some funeral home directors are saying, cremation isn't paying the bills anymore, so let me see if I can help people harvest some body parts. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
And, okay, then. Uh, yeah, check out our episode on the funeral industry as well. And thanks to all the uh, thanks to all the people in the funeral industry who wrote to us about that and gave us an insider peek. Uh, there is going to be one other phrase that you'll hear associated with body brokers. It describes a different, also at times equally unethical profession. It is the concept of getting kickbacks for referring clients to specific rehab facilities when they struggle with substance abuse. Uh, And that is a huge business we talked about in the past. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find an ending for this episode that is something better than people are terrible. Uh, Funeral should cost less. Not all people are terrible. Yeah, there we go. Hashtag not all people are terrible. Funerals should be less expensive. Uh, you, I endorse this message. <laughs> and this has been endorsed by Matt Frederick, first of his name. For president. For president. This, <laughs> this has been endorsed by <laughs> Matt Frederick for president. Uh, if you want to find out more about our dark money political a- action campaign to get our pal Matt elected to the highest office in the land, or if you want to give us your thoughts on the, the ethical dilemma of this trade, on the potential for just heartbreaking corruption and conspiracy uh, versus the potential for enormous breakthroughs in medicine. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us, like Noel said, at mattfrederickforpresident.com. Uh, or we had dot org. Dot, dot org. My, we are That's f- my entire... <laughs> we, we are a for-profit uh, presidential yeah. campaign. Uh, so... Yeah. <laughs> And our only donor is Illumination Global Unlimited. Don't don't worry about that though. It's fine. Yes. It's fine. Uh, but if you if you uh, don't want to dive with us into the world of crooked politics just yet, there are also plenty of other places you can find us online. Yep. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter, and you can find us on YouTube at the handle Conspiracy Stuff. On Instagram, we're Conspiracy Stuff Show. Uh, if you don't want to go on the internet at all, uh, you can use a telephone. Give us a call. Yes, you can call us. But before you do that. Consider buying our book. Huh, just think right. about it. I don't know. <laughs> give it a give it a thought. Yeah, there's a book. We wrote one. It's available. You can pre-order it right now. It'll get to you in October. Uh, that would be an amazing way to support our show if you choose to do that. That'd be great. If not, you can in fact give us a call. You can do both. Mm-hmm. Yes, you can. You can call us anytime you wish 1833-STDWYTK you'll hear a message telling you you're in the right place you'll have 3 minutes those 3 minutes are yours gratis they come from us straight to you get weird with them do whatever you want most importantly let us know if we can use your name and or message on air give yourself a cool nickname tell us what's on your mind and most importantly do not edit yourself. If you have a story that is 15 minutes or so and you feel like, oh, I got to call all these times, you don't. You can write out the story in full. You can send us uh, photographs. You can send us links. We read every single email we get. I'm actually on Twitter right now. I was asking people uh, earlier this week if they like emails or voicemails. It sounds like you like both. And we also, we also love being able to dive right into the rabbit hole on those emails. All you got to do if you want to be part Part of the party is uh, send us one. Drop us a good old fashioned line where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.